Ben Sutter, Rutgers University, the author of the book, They Came Before Columbus. Welcome. Good to be here, Gil. Now, there's been a lot of discussion lately about Mr. Columbus and what he did and what he did not do. But your research that you've expounded on in previous programs as years and years gone by, your thesis is older that uh, our presence in this in this hemisphere preceded the enslavement period that there was another period where Africans came um, tell me a little bit more about that and how it pertains to this discussion of Mr. Columbus nowadays well the first thing that we have to understand is that to assume that Columbus was the first to make contact with the Native Americans is something that um, does not take account of any of the evidence, including the evidence of Columbus himself. Columbus was the first person to suggest there were Africans in America before him. He actually says in the journal of his second voyage that when he was in Haiti, the Native Americans there told him that black-skinned people had come in large boats from the south and southeast trading in gold-tipped metal spears. Columbus actually sent back samples of these gold-tipped metal spears back to Spain. They were as said, they were inspected by metallurgists in Spain, and the Spanish metallurgists showed that they were identical with spears being forged in African Guinea. Of 32 parts, 18 were of gold, 6 of silver, and 8 of copper, just like the spears in the Caribbean. The words that were used by the people in the Caribbean that Columbus met in Haiti were identical with the words used in Africa all along the Atlantic coast. A range of words used for these spears. Are there a lot of writings from Mr. Columbus, by Mr. Columbus that survived? How do you know that he wrote? Oh yes, Columbus um, made up a lot of things, but he wrote quite a lot. I mean, he made up a lot about his background, even his name, etc. But there is no question that he wrote quite, he, he had at least four of his four major voyages. He left quite a lot of papers. There's a book published in this country in 1903, 2,114 pages, just on the surviving um, writings of Columbus, diaries of Columbus, things said about Columbus in connection with these diaries. Well, before we get into the era that preceded him, let's talk a little bit about Mr. Columbus. Um, who was he? Was he an Italian? What um, was his name? There's a question about Columbus. I have not gone very much into his identity because I know he made up so many things. There's a lot of confusion about that. Um, a book by Frederick Paul, The New Columbus, suggests that he was a bastard son of someone called Colon. His name was Cristobal Colon and that he took the name Cristoforo Colombo from a dead sailor because he'd been involved in some battle that opposed the Spanish sovereigns and he needed them at a certain time. He didn't want them to know about it, so he took on a different identity. There are lots of stories told about So that, him. Would, that would suggest he was Spanish? Um, Colón? Oh, yes. He, he wasn't Italian, but I don't want to say he was Spanish because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm making it quite clear there's a lot of confusion about mm -hmm. his identity. And uh, I have not been very much involved in that because my great concern has been to show that most people who are opposed to this thesis of an African connection with America are opposed because they assume that Europe was an advance, always an advance of other peoples, and that the reason why Columbus could sail and make contact first was because of the advance in their shipping. What we know now in 12 disciplines, Columbus, by the way, was not the only person to note these blacks. There are at least a dozen Europeans who noted them in that within the first 15, 100 years, seeing them in places where they had not been. There's a whole range of them, Peter Martyr, uh, Vasco Nunes de Balbo in 1513, finding blacks among the Native Americans. And he actually asked these people, where did these blacks come from? And they said, we don't know, but they're at a large settlement nearby. Uh, just a bit more about Mr. Columbus, because there's so much discussion. To the best of your knowledge, what was the premise of his voyage? Was it ex exploration or was it exploitation? Um, what Columbus hoped to achieve, you see, is that a lot of excitement had developed in Europe about um, the voyages of Marco Polo, about the riches of India, etc. 
And to get a route to the rich Indies would be a great um, achievement. But he assumed that because the war was wrong, and that was not his idea, the Moors had uh, made that quite clear that it, there was a the world was wrong and that if you go far to the west you end up in the east. He assumed that you could go to the west and end up in India. And he was so convinced of that that although he landed on the edge, um, on the little islands on the edge of America, he, he did not know it was a new continent. He assumed he was off the edge of Asia. Even if he had doubts, he made he he sent his notary Fernando Pires de Luna among the ships and made every man sign a document he was off the coast of Asia. And he threatened his men. If there were common sailors and they were to go back home and say that they had not been off Asia, they would be um, they would be whipped and they would have uh, their tongues cut out. And if there were officers, there would be fined 500 Maravedis. We do not know exactly what 500 Maravedis was at that time, but it must have been quite a punishment. So Columbus had to convince um, the Spanish that he had got to the Indies. And however, something happened which he did not expect. Um, they were um, discussing the de a demarcation line with Portugal because Portugal insisted that um, they should have a line drawn um, at the westernmost edge of the Cape Verde Islands just off Africa and that 375 leagues should be theirs. Mm -hmm. And this line in fact included Brazil. I have a map of Brazil in 1448. This is, this is more than half a century before Columbus. A map that was drawn on knowledge gained from the Moors. This is at, known as the Andrea Bianco map. So that, you see, the whole approach was that here we are, this is a great adventure, this is for wealth, etc. To hell with the people. I mean, the people were treated in the most awesome manner. Hands were cut off if they didn't pay the tax. I mean, the, the most incredible massacres. And Columbus was the first person to actually initiate slavery because he actually took half a dozen Native Americans with him back to Spain. And it, it, people are under the assumption, oh, these natives, they were so stupid, they thought the whites were gods. That is not the case. He left a fort in the Caribbean after his first voyage. And every man in that fort was slaughtered. When the natives realized that, um, that these people were vulnerable, there are all sorts of things in that situation. But Columbus was absolutely heartless when it came to dealing with the natives. Even when they were kind to him, and he recorded in his diaries how generous these people were, he was so deterred. The profit motive was so great. He was so greedy that it didn't really matter. I mean, people became nothing. To start your day with all the news and information you need to know, start your morning with Emerge. Subscribe today. Call 1-800-532-5700. That's 1-800-532-5700. Well, before we go on, what thoughts run through your mind as you see forces being mobilized this year to engage in a massive celebration of this man? Well, I think that it should be understood that this so-called discovery was a discovery for Europe and that this led to the ascendancy of Europe. It wasn't purely an accident because 1492 is a very unusual year. It was not only the year Columbus sailed, it was the very year that the Africans were defeated in Spain. The, the Moors were defeated in January 1492. The African General Boabdil surrendered in 1492 in Granada so that the ascendancy of Europe, the 1492 marked the ascendancy of Europe. The tragic thing is that since that time, we have assumed or been made to assume by the histories that have been written is that people of Native American descent or African descent 
had inferior civilizations mm -hmm. and that everything European was superior and that is the reason why Europe gave an ascendancy. All right, now let's go back in time to when our ancestors began to reach this hemisphere. Did they engage in hostilities or were they, were they able to live harmoniously with the indigenous population in this hemisphere? Well, it depends on the period. In such a short time, I could only touch on the late 14th, 15th century period. Okay. Where did it start? It started much earlier from different Africans, okay? Because we have evidence in pre-Christian times of Africans entering certain parts of Mexico and South America. Um, we have it from in terms of various cultures and in terms of a range of ritual parallels. But in the 14th and 15th century, we move on far more certain ground because the evidence exists in a dozen disciplines. We have writing, they're found um, African, uh, one of the African scripts. They have found African boats that could make those crossings. They have found maps indicating a crossing had been made. They have found linguistic connections showing words. They found plants, an American plant in Africa before Columbus, an African plant in America, more than one in fact. African plants in America before Columbus. They found a range of things like this, apart from the eyewitness accounts. Any, any idea what the motivation have, might have been for Africans coming to this hemisphere? In the case of Abu Bukhari II, this we know. The, the earlier visits, we can only conjecture that there could have been um, upheavals in the African world, like the Syrians attacking the Egyptians, etc., flights and so forth, trade, etc. But we, we, in the case of Abu Bakari II, we are, we are aware of his motives because it was written down. It doesn't just exist in an oral tradition. It actually exists in Arabic documents like the al Kalkashani and the Masalik al-Absar that he had expanded as far to the north as the Sahara, as far to the north as the desert, as far to the west as the, as far to the south, sorry, as the jungle, as far to the east as the Niger where he was wrestling with other African peoples, the Songhai, and he wanted to cross the ocean because he felt he could expand, okay. The, well, when he arrived, was his encounter with the indigenous population hostile? Only in one instance we are aware of hostilities developing because when strange people enter new territory, the natives might accept them or might not accept them and hostilities can arise, at mm -hmm. least initially. We have cases where, where fights actually developed in Panama between black Africans and Native Americans. What I'm getting at is, were, was his motive in coming to these shores the same as Mr. Columbus. No, no, no. You see, in the case of Columbus, this was, Columbus was a, a man seeking his fortune, who had not made himself. Abu Bakari II wasn't seeking a fortune, he was already made, he was a great king, he was very rich. He was not seeking um, the same things as Columbus, he was not driven by the same motives. And we have no evidence of Africans um, enslaving Native Americans. We have no evidence of them being brought over in, in situations of captivity. So we have no evidence of that. As I say, hostilities can arise occasionally because of the meeting of two peoples, regardless of race or intention. But we have no evidence that the kind of Columbus enterprise was the same. It was far removed because the Columbus enterprise, because of the lies of Columbus, it led people coming in millions, a steady, endless stream of Europeans leaving their countries to come in this direction in the hope of finding gold and having um, people subject to them, etc. This led to a whole different world order. How does an historian like yourself ascertain that somebody that far back in time was a liar or lied? Well, because of the conflicting reports and because of the lot of work has been done recently 
one of them one of the works done by Frederick Paul the new Columbus where he documents a great deal of things and I myself looking over diaries found inconsistencies serious inconsistencies where for example Columbus is in Cuba and the letter rise from King Ferdinand telling him to come home immediately because someone has appeared at the court Jaime Ferrer quarreling about this demarcation line and which throws a shadow over Columbus and Columbus pretends that he's too gravely ill to move would not go back home and writes in the reply letter that he is certain that Cuba is the continent now we know that that is a lie we know that's dishonesty because I found an earlier letter he wrote six months earlier um, in which he tells a friend that he sought in Cuba is an island because the natives who lived there for centuries have told him so and they could circumnavigate it. You find lies also about um, South America. When he's sent on the third voyage, he's given six ships and three are sent down to find this landmass that they hear the Portuguese are talking about. Columbus lands on the landmass, does not come off the ship. Every time we have friends over for a, should we say, little get-together, we reach for the tower. Tower. And he claims that South America is an island. He claims that Cuba is the continent. Now, obviously, and since there are things that indicate that this is not so, I mean, surely he could be wrong about the new world. I mean, he could be wrong about this being injured. He could have made a mistake. He could have thought he was off Asia. You could excuse that. But there are certain things you cannot excuse. You see, the man is deliberately involved in deception because he wanted the Portuguese to gain control of that landmass of the sun. Because he, I actually found the letter he wrote one of his sons, Diego Colum Columbus, in which he tells him that Vespus is about to appear in court, have him do this and do that, the man would do anything for me. In, normal, in the regular history, it looks like if Vespus is the rival. He is trying to, to, to fill his hand by allowing the Portuguese to enter Brazil and keeping the Spanish out. Well, why didn't he land on the landmass? Why did he stay on board his ship? Do um, we do not know. He claimed he had arthritis. One could accept that if one did not know how um, mendacious he, you, he was, because why wouldn't he claim that for Spain? Why wouldn't he dispute that landmass? But we, we, we have evidence that he was getting money from Spain and Portugal, and he was arrested. You see, the Spanish began to, to, to realize that Columbus was lying. He and, he and his brother Bartholomew, some people claim that was his uncle, most people think it was his brother, it doesn't matter, but both of them were arrested. On the fourth voyage, the Spanish allowed Bobadilla to arrest Columbus, and he was brought back in disgrace into Spain to be tried for lying to the Spanish about the lands he said he had discovered. And they claimed in, the, in, the, in, the, in court that Columbus was playing games in order to fill his um, his hands, one hand with Portuguese money and one hand with Spanish money. He was brought back in custody. Yes. And he was tried. He was tried. Was he convicted? No. He, 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 um, it appears that, um, I wouldn't say he won the case but because um, some of the things that he would have got, if it were not for the case, he did lose. He didn't lose all of his fortunes. It was reduced and he never sailed again. He never sailed again. Mm. So he did suffer as a result of the trial, but um, there were doubts about um, about certain things and then he also there were certain people of influence it seems some people have suggested that there was this relationship or a great affection that the queen had for him but that that is just news of the world stories so that um, one does not know what it is that saved him what was it that he brought back from the so-called new world on his voyages. You say he made a total of four or six voyages? Four, four voyages. Four voyages. On the first trip, one back. is aware that he brought back the um, half a dozen Native Americans who were eventually taught to speak Spanish. And of course... As slaves? Uh, I wouldn't say they weren't called slaves, but they were brought back um, 
against their will. Okay, so I mean you would call it slaves. I, I don't know if they were placed in captives positions of slaves. Yes, captives. Okay, and remember that these voyages weren't just Columbus entering territory on his own. These voyages brought thousands of people going in, taking parts of the Caribbean, taking parts of North America. So he left yeah. many of the voyages oh, yes. on so, shore. Yeah. And yes, and they established settlements, they built forts and towns and, and villages and churches, etc. I see. So they were able to establish a real foothold which was going to be expanded and to change the whole um, life of America. So based on returning after that first voyage with Native Americans, uh, how did he raise money for the second and the third and the fourth voyage? Oh, well, <coughs> then they got all excited when he came back and all the people on board said how they had actually found this land and mm -hmm. there was this chance of this new kingdom, etc. And of course, he kept up the lie that there was gold somewhere. Um, they didn't actually find the great goal they dreamed of, but they found lands they could expand themselves on, they could, um, it was rich in all sorts of things, there were new plants and foods. Mm -hmm. The foods in America, and a lot of people are not aware of this, that about um, half a hundred um, plants and fruits entered Europe, it doubled the food supply in Europe in 30 years. So that, that, that had, I mean, apart from the question of having uh, eventually um, being able to take Africans in to exploit the territory, to, to use them to um, work on these lands there, it altered the, the life of Europe. I'm Gerald. Yeah. All right, let's again go back in time. Do you have any ocular proof uh, of our presence in this hemisphere before Columbus? Oh yes, um, there are many heads of West Africans in the latter period and their earlier heads in the pre-Christian period. Something you can show us that yes. I can show in terms There's of There's one I, I, um, that doesn't deal with the period I've been dealing with, but which is very unusual because it has braids and this was this was deliberately um, covered up because this head has been it, it has not been shown in public for about 50 years it so these are braids here. yeah these are braids this is a stone head and where does this go back to what this goes on? back to Tresapotes it's a period before Christ and it's found on the head on a great stone head, a great sculpture in stone. Before there, Christ. Bef before Christ, it's found in the Olmec civilization. People have assumed that I said the Africans created Olmec civilization. I never said that. It's a homegrown civilization. It has African elements. We found it in the graves and we found it in their ritual life and other things. Here are now West African type heads. This is in a later period. But found before, in this hemisphere. Before, yes, this is found at Teotihuacan, one of the great cities of America. This is in the pyramid of Teotihuacan. Where is that now? What is that area called now? It's still called Teotihuacan. Where is it though? In Central America? It's in Mexico. Oh, in Mexico. Yes. I'm sorry. Clearly African. Yes. What else do you have? Um, you have a map here. Um, this, we have found um, this in Peru, we have, in fact, in, in South America, we have some of the most startling heads. Um, this is in Peru, we have many very realistic heads in Peru, and we have one of them in which we have the descendants of black governors in Ecuador. This is definitely a brother. Yes, and that is, that is in the Moorish period, that is 900 AD, that is um, long before Columbus. We have also, which is one of the most startling things, is the, the um, sons of black governors in South America. Um, blacks were shipwrecked in South America just a little after Columbus because they kept voyaging even after that period. And these are the sons of African shipwrecked 
Let's see if African. our camera can pick this up on the right hand page. Yeah, these are African, Africans were shipwrecked off the coast of South America, uh -huh. off Ecuador, and 17 of them were shipwrecked. Every one of them became the leader of the province, but and these is, are their sons. This is post-Columbian. This is post-Columbian, but why it is used is because it, it is not far after the um, coming of Columbus, and it, and it wasn't with European help, and it shows that these trips were going on, and in some cases they were continuing. Uh, Africa, you must realize, fell into a tremendous slump after um, Europe began to enslave great parts of Africa and many of its centers disappeared. The reason why uh, most of us have been made to believe that Africans were incapable of certain things is because we have not studied Africa. Even Africans do not know about Africa. Because remember that an amnesia descended on Africa and among people of African descent because of the fact that their centers were destroyed. What we have been studying is per perif surviving peripheries. That is what has led to a tremendous amount of confusion. For example, the Smithsonian found two African skeletons in the Virgin Islands, 1250 AD, more than 200 years before Columbus. They found they couldn't date them because something peculiar had entered their bones, but then they found the nail in the grave. Although they were in layers below Col before Columbus, they found the nail and they said, therefore it has to be after Columbus because Africans cannot make nails. But we have found, in fact, Africans making steel. 1500 years ago in Tanzania and along the lakes of Tanzania and Uganda, we have found Africans smelting steel in, the, in temperatures 200 degrees higher than anything achieved in Europe until the late 19th century. In, in your book here, you uh, made, uh, you have some uh, illustrations of the uh, ship, the Kantiki. Well, they, this is the attention. Ra One. The Ra One. The Ra One. The Ra yes. One, which is very important. But it is in, um, what is the significance of the voyage that Heyerdahl made? Okay, the, the significance of the Heyerdahl voyage is that we found that Africans had boats before Christ, which could cross the Atlantic Ocean. The Ra One was rebuilt by Africans, the Baduma people in Lake Chad, and in 1969 they were able to cross from North Africa all the way to Barbados mm -hmm. using a boat that Here was used is. long before Christ. Here it is. Uh, on the right hand page if we can pick that up okay and what is even more important let me close with this yes is that Africa that Lindemann and Bombard two independent sailors using African dugouts and an African raft were able to cross the Atlantic in less time than Vespucci in fact an African dugout crossing from Africa to America beat Vespucci by 12 days. Wait a minute, uh, tell me a little bit about this boat. Is it n true that it was made of papyrus reed? Yes, it's made of papyrus reed. And uh, an signed, exact replica of a drawing exact, that was found uh, yeah, in Yeah, Tuman Temple paintings in Africa. And they were able to, to th do this. They only made one mistake. They made a mistake with the rudder because over a period of time they had changed the rudder. Yes, and, and the that rudder point, made it kept it buoyant. The, no, the rudder got them into trouble off Barbados, but the um, there was something else that caused the problem. There was something attached to the deck that they yes. cut. Okay, but they were yes. able to cross nevertheless, and they were able to cross not only because of the viability of the vessel, they were able to cross because there are three currents off Africa that take you like gravitational belts from Africa to America, something which Europeans could not make use of. Yeah, I recall um, learning that um, the first voyage was not successful because mm -hmm. the ship uh, was lost its buoyancy yeah. because the builders of the boat uh, left off this this rope yeah. from the tail yeah. that uh, would squeeze the, the but, sea water out but of the But it was hull. valuable because it showed that even when the problem occurred, they still got as far as the Americas. They did. Yes, yeah. they did float on the currents and were able to make it towards the Americas more than 2,000 miles. So that even if there was an accident, they would still have made it. But the second voyage, they it's built it right and they made it intact. Yes. in this hemisphere, was there, was the content of the uh, impact that the African had on this hemisphere uh, a positive one? 
Um, well, it would involve a lot more discussion to show exactly what they did because you'd have to show, for example, what impact they had, for example, on their ritual and religious life, and in some cases, what impact they had on some early technologies. One has to do this with extremely great care because one is not suggesting the Native American was a fool. But whenever civilizations meet or peoples meet, they influence each other. And there's no civilization of consequence that was not influenced from outside in some way. What is important to understand is the capacity and potential that lay within these peoples before they were overwhelmed. Because what has happened in the last 500 years has given the impression that the reason why Europe ascended, the reason why it was able to conquer, the reason why it was able to remake the world was because other peoples were st stupid or they were on a lower level. Most people do not realize Africans made Spain. Africans brought most of their science to Spain. Spain was controlled by Africans and Arabs for about 700 years before the time of Columbus. There, um, it, it's in 1230 that it, that influence began to fade and they retreated to Granada where they were defeated by the Spanish. But before that they brought so many things. The Moors brought air conditioning into Europe. What they brought you, eyeglasses into Europe. What do you mean air conditioning? The, the, they developed, um, they were able, for example, to bring um, fresh drafts of air into houses during the summer and to draw upon the perfume of flowers. They, so it wasn't just air conditioning, but perfumed air conditioning. How would they do that? They constructed. Well, I do not know all the, the technical details of air conditioning, even today. I wouldn't know how air <laughs> conditioning works. But I have edited a book, Golden Age of the Moor, in which you have a detailed discussion of the many things that were introduced into Europe when Arabs and Africans, because Egyptians had left quite an influence in the Arabs, they developed their own thing as well, they quite an influence on North Africa. These people came up, took over Portugal and Spain, controlled it for hundreds of years, and brought a great range of sciences. Many things we take for granted, geometry for example, had lapsed. This was brought back into Europe through the Moors. Algebra which is Arabic, that was brought into Europe through the Moors. The, the, the leading books in mathematics, in medicine, came from the Moors. And they, they, when the first universities of Europe were being developed, they, they drew heavily on astronomical texts, mathematical texts, medical texts brought in by the Moors. The Moorish thing was mixed. They weren't just black people, but you had a predominant and powerful black element, and you have two emperors of Spain who were black. So, we are out of time, but you're saying then, if I, if I can paraphrase, that we need to really rearrange the premise of our uh, our look at the European role in world history, if not in this particular hemisphere. Our premise is off. Yes. This thesis has significance in that it forces us no longer to take the history of the Americas and the history of Africa and Europe for granted. It forces us to rethink things and to realize that the European jump wasn't simply a European jump that those breakthroughs that were being made in Europe wasn't simply European. We're not dismissing his own ingenuity, but those things were a result of a coming together of forces from all over the world. By putting his head on it and by unfortunately having this um, greedy man who became um, a force, the, the greed, the need to conquer people, enslave people, etc. This was an unfortunate result of this expansion and movement. One quick last question. Is it true that Mr. Columbus went back to Europe and lobbied for the institution of the slave trade? Is that true? I do not know um, about that. I know that Columbus himself um, did a lot to inspire and expand the slave trade. There was no question because there were people who fought against it and it could not win because the profit motive was too great. He himself as a person spending time on that, that I do not know. Okay. Yes. 
Professor Van Sergma, once again, it's been a privilege, and your discussion has been most nutritious. I thank you. Thank you, Gil. Preeminent figures are members of an organization called IAMIS, which stands for Italian Americans for a Multicultural United States. I'd like you to meet them. The founder is Juliette Uccelli, joined by Gilbert Fagiani, also founder of IAMIS, and also joined by Susan Cangiano, a member of IAMIS. Welcome to Like It Is. Um, I guess I can start with uh, you, Ms. Uccelli, and ask how uh, IAMIS came to be. Well, um, I, since the 60s, as a college student, I became involved in the anti-Vietnam War movement, and since that time, was active in different kinds of social justice causes. Um, and I realized, uh, when I heard, actually, Native American, about 10 years ago, read a poem called Columbus Day, that the whole image of Columbus was inimical to the other things that I believed in, and was really an insult to people of African American and Native American and Latino descent. Uh, and I felt horrified that there was no public voice of people from my ethnic group, Italian Americans, repudiating Columbus, um, and felt that it's really most definitely bad for all children, for Italian American children, Children, to have a hero whose, uh, whose fame is really based on deeds that did great harm to other people. That's not a real basis for anybody's self-esteem. And I also felt that, you know, the predominant image of Italian-Americans in the U.S. media is gangsters, and that when you look at Columbus did, he looted and pillaged and raped and stole people's lands and killed them. That's what a gangster does. So I don't feel that Columbus is any kind of real recognition of Italian-Americans as doing something useful, but really, the con uh, in a way, a continuity of that terrible gangster stereotype and should be repudiated. And I then found other people who had similar values, um, some of them, you know, the person who cuts my hair, a chiropractor that I had met, uh, as well as people who had worked in labor unions, um, who had these same ideas, and that's how we got the group together. I see. Uh, Mr. Fagiani, how, what does IAMIS do? Well, uh, we, we have um, tried to explore a more diverse uh, focus on what our identity and what our history is all about. Uh, we feel that um, uh, a, a, a multicultural approach and a more truthful approach as to the history of our country would also mean that uh, Italian Americans would have their history to uh, told uh, in a truthful way. And uh, we feel that it's not just uh, minority people that are denied their true history in, in, in the schools and in the history books, but al also immigrant groups of, of uh, European ancestry. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me ask uh, Ms. Cangiano uh, how you became involved with the organization. I became involved with the organization oh, God, was... a long time ago or recently? Basically recently. I started in an organization called PACE through my own... Um, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. No, I don't blame you. I used to be nervous when I started <laughs> in this game, too. As uh, an elementary school teacher, I started doing some of my own learning mm. about my own culture and realizing in the classroom how narrow perspective mm -hmm. history has been brought upon the education system. I see. And doing that, I started um, networking with other teachers who were very supportive uh -huh. and started learning different ways of expanding the educational process in the classroom. Not just dealing but with European history, but dealing with history of different peoples which were representative of the children in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started seeing that my own learning in school was very narrow and that I would not want to do, impose the same kind of narrow perspective that the schools offer today, most schools. I shouldn't say all schools. <laughs> well, now, what about your ethnicity, though? I mean, many of your kith and kin would say, notwithstanding what you say, uh, you're still an Italian, and the celebration has been going on long before you were born. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to change things and mess things up? <laughs> to which you might respond. It's not, it wouldn't be messing them up at all. It would be putting things in a, in a, a more honest and true light of what really happened. And we as Italians, this is all we have. Why would you right. want to take this from us, an Italian might say? 
Exactly. But th that is not all we have. Maybe in this society, that's all that's portrayed that we have. But there is so much more richer and heroic people that are not discussed and not talked about. We have this one Italian, maybe, <laughs> it's not even sure, <laughs> who is representative of a very conquering, um, sadistic, I want to say, and a cruel person. Maybe the things that he did that were good, mm -hmm. he brought uh, goods to Europe that, you know, helped them survive and, and develop as a nation. But the things that he did that were terrible, I mean, you know, people I know don't even know the story. What they know is just exactly what the textbooks have told them. They've never done any critical thinking on their own. And when you bring up these horrible things that Columbus has done, they are horrified as much as anyone else would be. Really? And they look and say, yes. They look is, and say, why? Is that what you've all found among your, your kith and kin, that um, the knowledge about Columbus is scant? Yeah, actually, yes. And, um, and sometimes, see, I think if you look back when Columbus Day was really pushed for by Italian Americans in the 1930s and 40s, you know, it was a time when police would swoop down on Italian American communities and do wholesale raids with the idea of we're looking for the black hand, we're looking for the mafia. There was a lot of discrimination in employment. Um, there was a lot of barriers to participation in citizenship. So at that point, people were desperate to say, we are Americans and one of us contributed something essential to America. America. Now, that was a point when there was not a lot of public debate and discussion about what Columbus did in reference to Native Americans. Now there is that public debate and discussion. So while I can understand why people did it at that time, why Italian Americans might have pushed for it, with the knowledge we have now, there's no excuse for keeping on perpetuating it. And I think, you know, I try to put out to people that I understand why people can be defensive, yet at the same time, this is not really in our interest, and try to put out some alternative Italian American figures. When was Columbus Day? born? Um, well, there, there's a whole history of the lobbying for Columbus Day. Um, the Knights of Columbus actually were started by uh, Irish priests in 1882, and they pushed Columbus as a hero and said that uh, he was an exemplar of what a Catholic and Christian hero should be. Um, beginning at that time and at the then the quarter centennial in 1892 is a heavy push for Columbus, and that's when the statue was put up with money that actually was raised by an Italian-American publisher from t mm. poor Italian immigrants. There's lobbying going on then through the 30s and 40s. However, there's also diversity in the community, which people don't talk about. For example, in Providence, Rhode Island, Rhode Island has the largest proportion of Italian Americans of any state in the country. Um, there was, in the 1930s, there were workers who attacked the Columbus Day Parade because the people who were leading it were supporters of Mussolini. And these workers were Democrats, anarchists, socialists, a whole mix of people um, who attacked Columbus Day for that reason. It didn't actually, um, also most people don't know that some Italians on the West Coast were interned during World War II and were released on October 12th. 1942 for Columbus Day. They were treated like the Japanese and Americans? Yes, it was not as massive and they were not held as long, but there were certain inter some internments in, in the Northern California area in particular. Uh, so when, it's a national holiday. Yes. It, it, when did that come to be? That no? came to be in the 1960s, much later than you would think. I, I don't know the exact date, but it was during the 1960s. I see. Um, what how do you argue with members of your your, your ethnic uh, group that um, say that you're being disloyal? Well, what I say is that uh, we're much... I, I see Col Columbus as sort of the Columbus pizza mafia rocky kind of stereotype or tapestry of stereotypes that uh, the mainstream pushes that's supposed to sum up our experience uh, as a people in this country. So I feel in some ways, aside from the, the, the moral dimensions of the, of the question of Columbus, uh, that it narrows our, our who we are because it focuses on one particular person rather than seeing that there's a, there was a whole host of people that played very important roles in this country politically, socially, culturally, artistically. And that, we're, that I can understand, it was, it's interesting, during the period of the 
of the 30, of 20s and 30s that Mussolini was a very popular figure in the Italian-American community. And I think there's a, there's a similarity in that Italians were feeling, there still was the insinuation that Italians were inferior people. There was still a lot of very negative things said about Ital Italians in the media. And I think Italians were looking for a strong man, some uh, person or image that would sort of, uh, you know, sort of make them feel better. And uh, they turned toward, towards them. Uh, that is all the time we have for this edition. But but uh, I must say that I think it warrants us coming back next week and continuing our discussion. Thanks for being with us. Catch us next week for a continuation. Good afternoon. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to Journal Graphics, 1535 Grand.